Welcome to the Unfinished Podcast. Truth be told, we've never really learned how to deal with our unfinished business. In a society that's taught us to be put together, what do we do when our world falls apart? Most importantly, why does our world fall apart? So right now we're living through the most significant transformation humanity has ever known. Knowing how to pick up our pens and write a renewed story has never been a more important conversation. So welcome to the podcast that interviews heroes that at some point had to start again and rise to glory. Cole Gibson. One of Australia's top 100 most influential women. Love is always there. The more love you give, the more you get it back. We're all connected. And that's unification. I didn't even mean to, to, uh, for this to be a nice segue, but I think this is actually a great place to start. Um, the idea that a creator at some point has to has to actually learn to let go of their creation. Oh, good one. Let's let's begin there because I think that that's that really is picking up where we left off last okay. time. This freedom and liberation, which is something that you talked about in getting to this place where you actually just let go of the need to do so much that liberated you and. Yeah, how does that how does that relate to this learning that I think every creator has to go through eventually, which is let go. Don't don't have founder syndrome. Don't grip your creations, you know, until they suffocate. Learn to let them breathe. So many people suffocate their visions, and I have watched them, coached them, and enabled people suffocating their visions. <laughs> and people have done that for me. Um so maybe like there's a knowing that you have that this isn't right. You know, let's start there. What's that knowing? Not I believe, you know, <laughs> believe, believe in knowing is different, right? <clears throat> yeah. And, man, it takes a lot of discipline to listen to that part of you that says hmm, something not right about that, which is different to doubt too. Uh, and I had just had this knowing um, probably a year before I even did it, um, but I didn't listen to it. Mm. And then I started to float with people. I think it's time to wrap up something that went on for a decade um, for me. I mean, for the rest of the organisation or everyone involved, it was maybe five years for them. Uh, I don't know. Where do you go with this? Uh, the, the lessons of, um, okay, let's, let's start with <clears throat> A, why do we struggle to let go of our creations? Example, just for context for, for, for you and, and the listeners. Mm -hmm. The second I learned as an entrepreneur that I didn't have to do it all and actually <laughs> not doing it all serves the vision so much more than trying to do it all actually just holding your ground and, and, and knowing, okay, this is, this is the role I'm meant to play and to, to not go outside of those lines and to have boundaries has allowed the organisations that I've built since to grow in so much more of an effective way. Um, Amazing. You know, why do we struggle with that? Expectation. Like... You don't realise that you're, you're, you have this expectation of where the end point is or the compass on the map, you know, the compass is directing me this way and I've put my destination here and I'm going to get there. Mm. You know, some psychologists call that grit, you know, determination and perseverance. But I also think there's stupid fucking grit too. Like when you're expecting and attached to the end result, it's chaos. Um you said what happened? Okay. What, what happened? Um, I think you start to really, you think, you start, I started judging that everyone, I, oh, this is who I am, this is my identity. I have to, I have, they're expecting, that's why I say expectations. They creep up on you. Everyone expecting me to do X, Y, Z. Here's my behaviour. I've learned it forever to do this way. And then I guess when you start to break up with anything, you start to see uh, the error of that, um, 
the, the behaviors that don't serve you, you know, it really was a relationship, like a long term relationship. Mm-hmm. And you start to realize that your values have changed. Like that stuff takes some serious meditation or mindfulness to, to recognize that your values have changed as you're growing this thing. Is that true? Is that, you know, like as you're growing it, you're heading this way, but your values are changing. Um, maybe your skill is, maybe you're also just bored of doing the same thing day in and day out. So I really had this expectation that I was supposed to be here and I couldn't let go of it for quite a while. Um, And to my detriment, burnout, arguing with people, you know, even just like mismanaging the infrastructure of things and that was just chaos. Um, Yeah, it was. And how did did that manifest? So you felt, right? Yeah. You felt that people had an expectation of you. But I'm interested in what what the mirror was. Did you find that you yeah, had an expectation on others that they couldn't meet? So it constantly felt like there was more to do, not enough was being done. Like where did that come from? Um, I think I said it in the last period that um, the last episode of Em and Nicole um, <laughs> where you literally believe your own bullshit like my identity was sort of caught up in it um that I've I've got to do this and so the mirror became this sort of it was my need it was my worth like to run this thing or do this thing and I don't think I'm being very articulate but it was a more of a um it was it was a want like I wanted it not that I needed it It was just this unconscious insecurity. It was a worth thing for me towards the end there. And I was so burnt out. I couldn't really, like I could now, recognise what serves me, what doesn't. Mm. So you're just completely blindsided by by where you think you need to go. And it, yeah. it railroads your relationships, the the opportunities that are outside the expectation that you feel is on you to deliver certain outcomes. Yeah, I just don't know that so many people around me would have been like, no, wait. and they did. Like I had my co-founders at the time. I was like, I I can't do this X, Y, and Z. Mm. <sighs> You're doing it. And I've talked to one of them about how I told them we needed to stop X this program and, and you know, had people around me who were enabling this, no, we need to finish here. You know, this is where we're going to finish. And that's just not how projects work like you've got to pivot and go with the need of the group or change with the resources that you have like we were blindsided by the vision oh you know what I what I love about the importance of having this conversation is I mean entrepreneurship is obviously something and creation is something I'm incredibly passionate about and I think right now Mm. on the planet it really is going to be the vehicle that helps humanity move forward you know from what we've what we've undergone and what we've been through and when you when you look at statistics like you know one in 10 startups succeed which means 90 percent of startups fail and I look at that and I just think like why you know yes there's high risk yes there's things that are completely outside of your control um in running a project a business whatever but there are actually a lot of things, I think, like th- what, what we're speaking to, founder's syndrome, the ability to let go as, as a creator, the ability to be flexible and fluid and agile, which often gets stifled and isn't even a part of the thinking of a leader of an organisation because of all of these unspoken, you know, factors that wow. affect someone so, so much personally that it ends up getting out of control. You know, like uh, the interviews I was just doing is for the foundation I started many years ago that I'm no longer operational in and I just sit on the board. And I find it so easy now that I've let go and I'm just there as a board member, I find it so easy to see where the problems are, to bring in, you know, the right things for the solution. I, I'm, I'm so, it's like I have this crystal, crystal awesome. vision of, of what needs to happen. But when when I was in it, I, there's no way that I would have had access to that same perspective 
And I would love to, you know, hear your wisdom of how someone who's maybe in that situation you were in, yep. what perspective, what questions could they sort of yep. ask themselves to prevent the, um, the grandiosity of the, what became the, the problem and the breakdown? Uh, it's funny. I kind of had this conversation earlier today that, you know, these activism or advocates or social change whatever fancy word you want to give us, um, practitioners, um, dreamers. Um, my first thing that I look at is, um, you know, putting, it's so almost standard, but like putting your well-being first. And my sort of subtext to that is, is I was giving up myself for my organisation. Mm. I was like completely what I was coaching, I was running workshops, I was on boards, I was on advisory boards, I was doing them, you know, there was a huge team, but I just constantly gave up. And I think the difference that anyone can learn from is give of yourself, like you are doing in your, what you just said then so beautifully, you can give of yourself to the foundation, but you're not giving yourself up for it. That's right. And it's no longer me. Yeah. But whether it like of course I want it to succeed. I want I want it to succeed with my whole heart, but it doesn't change how I feel about myself if it doesn't. And right? then from that yes, that's, that's yes, a really big thing for people. I don't feel differently about myself dependent on the results of my you know external business relationships. I have that solid relationship with myself. And that's why I, I think that is that's it. Like that's the core of you're going to be great if you can be in that place. But when I say well-being, I'm also talking about your health. Like, yeah. Maybe some people are just super healthy and no problems, but I think quite often when you're running a business, it's almost like it's a joke how burnt out everyone gets. <laughs> it's Larry. embarrassing. I was like, you know, I spent Larry. 20 years and never got but no, well, I didn't get it to, but I didn't get what burnout was until this period because I was like, shit, I was burnt out for years, Nicole, years. But you just have to keep soldiering on and getting it done. That I think another part of well being is, and I think this is a circumstantial, but are you aware of your body? You know, like I reckon I that was something for me to really understand that I was pushing so hard that that's what was ruining my health too of like I'm I'm so strong my mind is like I'm a machine when I have to get something done I'll get it done so I'm, I'm curious for people listening like how much do you really you know have your rituals and routines down like mm. yeah there was something we talked about last time it, you know you got to work hard at that well-being spiritual connection and work becomes easier yeah but not work harder and then, you know, put a little bit of stuff into your well-being. It's actually the other way around. Work becomes easier when you are looking after your well-being. So 101, I almost laugh at myself. I'm like, you idiot. Um, I think as well, like as you're doing it, uh, this is all very personal, but, you know, don't start something unless you've got a big fat savings account full of money. <laughs> that- that's, that's some advice for you. Do you have a big fat account where you are not tapping into that you are like, this is serious. Like this is a funny one because I'm a poor kid from the hood. So <laughs> let, not me, everybody, let me spell it out for you. Let me spell it out. So <laughs> I've, not- got, <laughs> I've got ridiculous unconscious money issues when I'm burnt out because I can't bring awareness to them. And that's what kind of happened to me is I think sometimes when people want to create things, it's like just have three months of your of your savings or at least really have think through your finances, you know. And I, t- I tapped into all of our savings and I fucked it up when I couldn't get that replenished. And so that really created an instability. And I think that's something that never gets spoken about. Mm. How many people are doing this on an oily rag but are just not stable financially? Yeah, I think there's some valuable keys actually in here because you're right, it doesn't. I think a lot of of people tell the story like 
jump into it, you know, with with your whole heart. And I actually, I do believe that, but I'm also a believer in in knowing your shit. Like you've got to, you've got to be aware <laughs> that there needs to be an awareness of of what you're getting yourself into to to understand your runway, to know your figures, to and yeah. you know what that awareness is. Like you've done the work on it. So I really encourage people. Well, you break it down. What does that mean to you then? Because someone who's well, yeah, yeah. what does that mean to be if it, aware if, of? If it's if it's going to help, if it's going to help you guys, I mean, that there are things that I've learned in the past couple of years that I, in my other pursuits that I wish I had known in the nonprofit space. But it was interesting because that often that activist space and nonprofit space is not talked about, um, and just the basics of you know if you um uh going to launch something you need to understand the runway required to get it to that point of launch so the way i look at runway is how many months worth of revenue income is required you know look at that revenue against your strategy have a a fallback as well so if if your strategy says it's going to take you six months you know you probably want to have a runway of about nine months just to be sure um, and you've also got to be having very key measurable indicators as to whether or not the strategy is working. Because if you get three months into a six-month strategy and you're halfway through your funding um, and it's not working, you've got to really be willing to be flexible, agile, creative. I mean, in startups, this is why they, they um, emphasize pivoting so much um, is because <laughs> your, your company will go bankrupt, you know, if you don't, if you, if you don't if you don't pivot. But I think like the the challenges that are underneath all of these things, because these technical skills, they can feel really overwhelming to learn, but they're really, it's not, it's, it's sort of common sense. But I think all of these emotions get in the way. People don't make it about what it really should be about. And if someone had sat me down 10 years ago and said, you know, at the end of the day, this is what business is. Business is uh, identifying a problem and finding a solution to that problem. Yeah, and if you if you can't if you can't clearly define the problem that you're solving and you can't clearly define how you plan on solving it, you don't have a business. And I think there is a real danger, and maybe it's more because I'm more risk adverse, um, or maybe more aware of many different contributing factors that. I think I had an incredible amount of people. It'd be another point that always have a kitchen table around you, you know, these mentors or these advisors who have gone through the process and can advise you. And without them, I wouldn't have made it to 10 years. But I noticed even at the last year or two, we were outputting so much that I didn't even make time to get their advice. And for someone at that table to be like, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. You know that, and that was a, yeah, like that's a, that was a mistake. Know your constantly. key priorities. Actually, what all of these strategies that we're talking about in the context of of a, of a business, I think it's so relevant to you know life. And I, I've actually been told that I, I'm a little bit too like I run everything in my life a bit too much like a business, including my relationships. But there's there's something valuable in that. You know, because what that means for me is not I see everything as a transaction. It's for me I'm intentional and I understand what my key priorities are and what my non-negotiables are. And I work I work at that because to have that mental clarity means that I can show up in an optim, in an optimal way. Otherwise, I'm going to feel chaotic. I'm going to feel burnt out. I'm not I'm not going to take the time to go to the gym and eat the right food, and because I'm going to be so consumed, emotions. Um, oh, I think, and like, yeah, go. Well, I, you know, there was that. How many years did we hang out for? Um, <clears throat> but I, I saw it in you. I saw it in so many of my social change people. Like, there's this erraticness of so much stimulus, and you know, we're on our phones, and we have got an audience, and we're connected to so many people that. I'm not saying that happens for everyone, but it's like an ebb and flow, like, mm. wasn't it? That when and but you have to kind of experience it to then become aware of it. Yeah, you've got to learn. 
you gotta you learn. Know? Totally. And, uh, you know, then just learn, 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 learn from other people's like honesty as well. If if this is connecting to you, and there's some of this kind of forethought that you can give, I think too. And we probably underestimate like the work that that we were both doing ten years ago. It was pioneering. It was pioneering work. Like there were really. I would like to think so. <laughs> it was. Let's just let's just own it. No one like there, there were some people that had tried to you know talk about development and stuff, but like community based mental health, transformational facilitation in in the way that you were doing it in your events. Like I was trying to drive policy change for for mental health. You know. As, mm-hmm. like, so good. I was like, who, what is she? No, this is so cool. Who is this chick? And it, there's something about being a, a starter, you know, that you do have to kind of learn things the hard way. But that's why I value these conversations because there's yeah, I just want to be real there. about it these days, you know. It's yeah. like... There's going to be people that, that are coming into that now and it's not a completely new space, that there have been some infrastructures that have been built you know and I know like a lot of the people that listen to this podcast for instance they're interested in social change they're interested in impact I think specifically right now they um they see the challenges that are existing in the world and they want to do something about it and I just want to say to you guys you can you really you really really can and there's an effective way to do it and an ineffective way to do it. And one of the other things that I've learned, you know, is to, to a founder's demise often you want it to be like you have the vision in your mind and you want it to be exactly how you see it in your mind, which is sort of what we're speaking to. And mm. the blinkers can also go on when it comes to who else has an aligned vision. Like this is how I now do business. It's it's so simple but so incredibly transformative it's called trade it's been done from the dawn of time and it's way better <laughs> to do business in collaboration in trade <laughs> That's right. Right. Who, who else sees what i see Let, i'm just going to park my ego and my insecurity and whatever at the door and start to have conversations with people that say see the same thing as you awesome. and figure out how you can do it together figure out how you can bring things together in a way that is. And I think the reason people resist it is they struggle to believe that there's actually a win-win way to facilitate that. But there is always a win-win way. There is a way that you can get what you want. There's a way that the other person can get what they want. And the impact you create subsequently is better and more effective. Oh, preach. Love it. I'm trying not to talk over you. Yeah, <laughs> like, like, so right. I, haven't, I haven't had these kind of chats for ages. I'm like, I've just, I've, I've, <laughs> I've you know, I still remember somebody. Yeah, this is a cool one. This is a great one that I had this somebody, somebody who was going to do some serious work for me. And I thought we were the perfect pair. It would mean that, you know, like you said before, I don't have to do everything. I can let them do the training part. And, you know, I step over here and uh, yada, yada, yada. And he said to me, after avoiding me for weeks, and I've got like 100K in sponsorship sitting there and waiting for him. And anyway, it was getting really frustrating because he just wasn't opening the lines of communication. So I was like, what's going on? Just talk to me. I just think we're competition. That's and what I was saying. Like, yeah, I said, oh, what do you mean? He goes, well, what you're asking me to do, I want to do in the future. Right. And yes. and I was like, but don't you understand that this is how you can still do that, but you're using it as a test and I can really leverage that and vice versa. But I, I actually thought at the time after he decided not to work with me that I had it wrong. Like I, I remember at the time I sort of went, oh, right, yeah, right. So you can't, you can't work together with people where you, you're, you've got similar values. And anyway, but I've reflected on it, like you're saying, these days. And I go, that is not how you do business or social change. Um, and I definitely think we were young and maybe immature, less immature. <laughs> Uh, I have, but isn't that interesting? Do you don't. Uh, do you see? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm reflecting because I think that this is. I, I really do feel the reflection 
has actually is is beautiful because I feel like I'm really at a place where I know how to engage that I don't create that anymore. But I'm thinking yeah. back, especially when I was running the foundation, how common that that truly was. And it would often be people internal that you would train up and they wanted to, you know, they became facilitators or program managers and then they wanted to do it on their own. And so how do you as a leader align those interests? Um, mm-hmm. And I think the lesson I really had to learn was it's just really about creating space for people. And so the second people feel unseen and unacknowledged is the second they're going to want to go their own way. But if you, and, um, you know, I think. Incredible. Yeah. So, so, so some of the best entrepreneurs in the world are relational entrepreneurs. They, they put um, the person first. They put the person at the. Man, uh, that's gold. I loved hearing that. Yeah, at, at the centre. But I'm interested in, because I think this is probably what will be most valuable for people, because sure, I think a lot of leaders have heard that, but wh- why don't people do that and what do they need to work through in themselves? What do they need to start opening their minds to, to, to see that they maybe currently don't see and it's creating that problem for them? I've always been somebody who really likes to take an emotional word and Google it search it up, look at memes, look at, look at quotes, you know, really get to know the, the emotional words that impact us. And I think one of the coolest things I ever did was I kept feeling a sense of jealousy or envy. Mm. And I think in that moment um, he was projecting that onto me, that what I was doing at the time he was envious and he wanted to be doing it, but he felt very, um, he even told me like years later, he just felt like he couldn't compete, you know, and I think even when he said, you're my competition, you know, it was wow. so blindingly sitting in front of me. That I, I, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are, but I, I think jealousy and envy um, is one part, even like in relationships, when someone sort of, rejects you or like you said you're not they're not seen when you're trying to make this stuff work you know it it is jealousy get to know it it is envy what does it mean but there's like an a myth in our world don't you reckon where why does why do why do I feel shame when someone else yeah rejects it or or doesn't want to do it with me like what is this mythology that it's not that um that this shit should be easy when you're trying to create a collaboration or even a relationship <laughs> or friendship, right? Like yeah. there is something in the world, in our society, where we have been trained to believe that it's easy. But in fact, like if only he knew back then that it was going to take it was going to take some time to trust me and believe that he was going to do X, Y, and Z. And had I known that, I would have been like, here, I'm going to show you you go away and think about what really is the problem that you're facing and hear how I think it is a solution, you know, like in hindsight. Yeah. Look, there was a lot there. Take what um, you will. I, I think that it's created because of a few different things. I think one thing, and I, I find myself talking about it a lot actually, is this society where we're only ever seeing the finished result. And I think that that has damage beyond what any of us are conscious of because how do you learn anything like let's go back to being a child you know you learn to cook because you see your mom cooking you learn to walk because you see the people around you walking you learn to talk because you hear them talking like you you model you know and it's it's the mirror neurons in us that the model so in in a society now where most of our consumption is digital and what people are putting out digitally is the end result it your brain just sees the end result and it thinks well I was able to consume it like that so I should be able to do it like that and you're not seeing any of the process which is actually a big intention for this um, podcast and these conversations is it doesn't matter you know, how incredible you are as a human being, talented, how far you've climbed that that ladder of success. Every human I've ever connected to has had 
unfinished business or something that's incomplete, unfinished. Maybe it's childhood trauma. Maybe it's that desire to be seen, you know, that drives a competition. Maybe it's, um, you know, they went through a really bad uh, divorce and like their, their whole motivation is to regain what they lost. You know, like all of us have these far more intricate personal motivations and drivers in us that most of the time are not seen and not known. And sometimes, and I've found this fascinating in the last few people I've interviewed, sometimes mm-hmm. not even known by the individual themselves. So these, these, these driving factors and of these parts of themselves that were incomplete, unfinished, that they're, they're trying to resolve through their life. And one thing that I hope for so much through these conversations that my listeners can get is to understand that it is if you spend your whole life purely focused on having everything neat and finished and that becomes your whole drive you know in life to finish consciously or unconsciously you you will miss out exactly you'll exhaust yourself and you will miss out on so many things like life has forced me into situations this past couple of years where I've been forced to be present with things that I can't finish when I want them finished. You know, I think all of us have. COVID has done this to the world. You want to, you want to reopen your business. You want to see your family member and you feel that sense of hopelessness and powerlessness. Can we change that narrative, you guys, just for a second and start to understand the gifts? Because as soon as we get good, at being in that unfinishedness, as soon as we get good in being in the incompleteness, as soon as you get good at being with your jealousy, you know, being with the part of you that wants to compete, these are powerful insights that actually, as counterintuitive as it feels in the moment, will enhance your quality of life when you stop running away from it, when you stop allowing the the defense, the defensive behavior to actually be the driving force as to how you cut through the world, but actually to be humble and vulnerable in it is going to allow you to experience yourself and experience your creation and experience life and and relationships in so much more fullness. (laughs) Right, so thanks for coming on the podcast and we're just going to finish it up. <laughs> I just, you know, I think we even tapped into it last time. Like it's so natural. I think, I think, I think that's what I remember from finishing with. It's so natural to be unfinished. I mean, I did watch Star Wars on the weekend, ready for my getting out. Yeah. It's good. You know, people people forget, like in the stories of old, you know, they're talking about may the force be with you. And here I am being like, oh, I forgot about the force. <laughs> and it, it's, it's, it's the biggest sci-fi geek movie ever. But I'm watching this and they're telling the story of, you know, the darkness and the light. But all the way through it is just this constant conversation about, which one is it, but both of them are just so necessary for the story, for the narrative. And sometimes I, it's a bit out there, but even just hearing what you're saying then of how do you, how do you know that you've got both, but both are necessary? Mm. Yeah, I, don't, I don't even have be, the language for it. Be in it. Like, yes, this is, it's about learning to be in it. And it can be so difficult because I think the shame that you were speaking to right of like why do I feel shame when someone else you know expects something of me or or is jealous and why do I feel shame when someone's jealous of me you know these are things that so many of us experience um unconsciously and and what I want to help everyone become aware of is is actually what those symptoms are that you can start paying attention to you know because just ask yourself the simple question where does suffering exist in my life that question has been. I remember you saying that last week. I love that. So <laughs> transformative. Just where, where is the pain? You know, and rather than running away from it or pretending like it's not there, where be honest about where you that know, is. And, and don't you think a lot of people, they don't necessarily, or I don't 
things, especially in the social change world, <clears throat> they're always moving forward. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I think that there's, there's, there's a lot to say about someone who doesn't really do anything for three full days. You know, on one side, it's like creative people really need to sit on their own a lot. <laughs> yeah. You know, or I really need to move forward in my life and I don't like where I'm at. Well, you need to maybe just go internal for three days and don't leave your house. Uh, You know, like there's nothing wrong with feeling sad or shameful for a couple of days until it bubbles up and dissipates, you know. It's a bit bit like steam almost. Like how often do people when they're saying, what is this? What, what is it? Where am I suffering? You know, this is also a physical symptom too. Sit with it. Mm. Like, what is sit with it? Like, you know how people say that all the time? It's like, can you just sit with it? I remember one of my coaching clients came to me and said, I'm going to yeah. pay you for six months if you can teach me how to sit with it. And I was like, oh, that's a really interesting question. What is this sit with it, Nicole? How would you describe How do, you, how do you get people to sit with their suffering? Uh, I mean. Other I, than going to a cave like a monk. I Yeah, I mean, the reason I'm laughing is because there have literally been times where the only way I could get myself <laughs> to sit with it was to put myself alone in the Amazon jungle, you know, to, to do it. And I am I am quite extreme. I mean, the like. <laughs> you know, this or that, and it's you're either going to love it or hate it about me. But there have been times where that really has been what I needed to do. And I think, like, the, the key there in my evolution and growth and, and perhaps the wisdom for someone listening is I needed to find the courage because it was about being honest with myself. And for me at that point, like, use the Amazon jungle, which was a real story. I went and sat in silence by myself in literally one of the most remote places in the world. I was up, I cried. I bawled my eyes out when I got there. Yeah. I was, I you, was so fucking You scared. had no fucking <laughs> right. Good on you. I was so scared. But I couldn't, the honesty that I had to come to was I, I'm not going to do this unless I go into this environment that literally forces me because I was so bad at it, actually. I was so bad at sitting with myself that I needed that extremity to kind of help me You know, and and it's like a very common thing that people will share in these stories is the second I stopped fighting, which took days, it took days. And I I literally felt like the world was was caving in on me. That literally, because it it was. (laughs) But the the, the second that I surrendered, um, ease was brought to that suffering instantly, you know, and and love, love returned. I mean, I'd, I'd, obviously that's not sustainable, so I've had to learn to get better at it <laughs> day to day. And um, it's it's an awareness thing for me, like a lot of the trauma that you spoke to in our last episode, for me, the way that it manifested was not obvious because I was very high-functioning, like very, 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 high very functioning. high-functioning. So I think if you are like that, you know, be aware that it's not always, it's not always obvious. Like I would have maybe every two or three months, I'd have an anxiety attack. And yeah, all the time. I, I didn't, but because it was a few months, right? When I had the anxiety attack, it had lasted a day and then I'd, it would be done. And it was just this thing that I sort of was like, oh, I will, I just have random anxiety attacks, you know, like that's kind of how I just, I, and what I needed to start to become aware of was the accumulation of all of those triggers and all of those stresses day to day over months would accumulate until literally I could no, I couldn't control the effect anymore. And that's mm-hmm. how it would manifest. And it wasn't until, and, and a lot of the time I was in relationships where that would happen and I had, um, you know, one of my exes in particular would see how high functioning I was day to day. And so when I had an anxiety attack, they were almost very like judgmental of it. Like, this is not real. You know, you're, this is, you're, you're faking this because how could you be suffering this much? And then so high. Fun- and I, like, I believed that. Oh, Nicole. Yeah. I believed that. I was like, well, 
fuck like am I you know am I being dramatic like that that's kind of what I told myself and I think I know that place where you bring it back on yourself yeah and I would blame myself um and it wasn't until I stopped and I was like I'm actually not and like I'm not an uh, irrational and reasonable person there's a reason that I'm experiencing this and I need to look at what that is and what you just said before being aware of your body when I did end up going to a therapist she asked me a question which changed my life because when I was answering her questions about this experience and I was using language like oh well I think you know um I think this and this is what I see my language is very analytical and visual I see this I think this you know or it used to be I've come more into Mm -hmm to a kinesthetic now but it was very and her her question to me was um what does your body feel about what you're saying blew my fucking mind blew my mind because in in that moment I was like my head is so far away from my body what I think I should do and what my body actually feels and and the you know what the the most confronting thing about this therapy was how inadequate i felt listening to my body if i was to truly listen actually you're tired today you, yeah. you need a break you, yeah. you that relationship's not healthy for you whatever mm-hmm. you know that conversation actually feels really confronting for you i because my head was like no you can do it just fucking do it yeah, that's, I said the same thing. Like I was like, my so strong, but yeah. the body has a very different story for you. Yeah. It is crucial to listen to it. Well, it's, it's way more intelligent. And, and I think back to the original point, the more I've started to do this, the more I've let go of like the, the control. And, you know, the irony is your head's going to tell you, yeah, but this won't get done and blah, blah, blah. Things get done way more effectively. <laughs> Like you, you're not trying to control things, which creates space for other people to be able to support, you know, and drive drive things forward. And you're not scared to voice your needs anymore. And you feel oh my god, thinking about what I said earlier about all of the issues I went through compared to who I am sitting in this chair listening to you, I'm like, oh man, I'm like Neo in the Matrix. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, cool. <laughs> come at me sure i'm being i'm really showing my geeky sci-fi today anna i love it i love star wars so i'm, I'm yeah but it's it is it is that journey and i i sort of you know no no regrets i i love what i've been through you know for for, for all of it it's it's been a hero's journey <laughs> um however <laughs> someone had sat me down and said hey here's some key key things and maybe that's what we can tie into the 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 end of this this podcast like the the checklist but if you were to sit down and get this right at the beginning of a pursuit how much it would actually save you what what are those things I think definitely it's so funny we're having this conversation today bring your mind and body into balance which means bring, taking- your mind, bring your body, yeah, listen, this, listening to it, body practices. If you want to look into it, semantic therapy, um, somatic therapy, you know, like polyvagal um, theory, like these are all really cool theories to learn and then to practice and immerse mm-hmm. yourself in. Yeah. Be aware of your Be honest. Yeah, I was going to say the awareness. Yeah. What, what did yep. you say? Sorry. I think another thing on the checklist <laughs> would be uh, honesty with self around your insecurities. So these, this includes like the parts of you that want to compete, the parts of you that feel inadequate, the parts of you that need success in order to, you know, feel significant or enough. Definitely that's all there. The parts of you that like to control. Oh, man. What a control freak I was in that phase. Probably still am, actually. <laughs> we'll see. I was even having a conversation today about um, 
maybe one we haven't touched on, but I'll keep it short, is, you know, when you're creating something, I'm Polynesian. And in my culture, right, you honour the collective. Mm-hmm. You know, its values as a common, as a group, are breathtaking. And this collectivism, when you're creating things, like you sort of said before, you know, why am I doing this? What's the purpose and being intentional? You've got to ask yourself a lot of the time, probably one of the biggest things I learned was there's a very capitalist, masculine, you know, bringing in the colonisation part of me too, of just thinking you, your body will know when it's in that in that place too. Like you have to bring it back to values-driven and community and collectivism. And from that place, you're so much more grounded in the work with people, you know, with change. Um, but I, I do think a lot of people don't realise the this sort of capitalist system, how it infiltrates you yeah, as a human. Your thinking. Yeah, that that is super, super valuable. When, you, when you're driven by achievement, <laughs> then it's really like it's, it's like, you know, corporate capitalism is profit at any cost. Profit at any cost as a mindset. Think about that in your life. Profit at any cost. And it's a point of reflection <laughs> for, for, for you all. <laughs> That's it. Just be Polynesian, you know. <laughs> I honour you. Yeah. The, you know? the community capital, not just not just corporate capital. That's it. And social connection at its core. Um, I, I, li- I think that's been a really beautiful thing in this stage of unbecoming Mm. I've been calling it unbecoming my old self Um, I had a community reach out on this actually and share something that I thought was so important um she was I was actually asking her views on on Facebook's metaverse I don't know if you guys have seen Zuckerberg um, so good launching you know in so many ways yes but then what's the other side is when we feel we can be in a room with each other without leaving the computer, you know, what are, what are the risks associated with that? And she was just sharing some of her thoughts on um, if we're going to, if we're going to have such a focus, which we inevitably do now um, on globalization as a human being, we need to have the polar in our lives, localization, you know, presence, localization, community. And I, I really agreed that there would be detrimental effects on us emotionally, psychologically, physically. Like if I can be sitting in a room with you, but I'm never experiencing touch, there's a real life effect on, on how I evolve and how I have my needs met as a human being. Yeah, I don't know whether to be scared of it or... <laughs> fascinated of what's going to happen in the next few years in this last little bit of my lifetime (laughs) uh I'm only 40 but that's super fascinating I could start a whole other podcast just on that statement yeah from her so localize that should be on your checklist have real people around you real people around you real people yeah, because you will get defensive in your insecurities, and you will not listen. Yeah. But real people will cut through, cut through your mind, mm. and they will listen to your body saying, "This is not right." And you know, like it's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think that that's so valuable. I guess the question to ask yourself would be, you know, where do you push away actually people that truly see you? because you're not ready to confront um, that part of yourself. And are we cool if they push us away too, you know, like Mm. I see it, I'm curious about it, I'll come back to you in a different way. I think sometimes we attack people, again, feel that shame when they can't hear you, but it's like, you know, you really really get to do that for others, right? 
Yeah, I believe that really strongly. Yeah, be that for other people. So listen, listen to your your body and your mind. Bring them into cohesion. Mm. Yeah, I just I think even even listening to this whole conversation or listening to your words. Have a sense of local. Yeah, mm. and then finally on the checklist, localized support. As you were saying. Yeah, like I'm involved in a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, that's the fancy term for the experience of belonging. <laughs> Everyone's hardwired to belong, but it seems to be this funny thing in social change now that it's absolutely called for Black Lives that um, Me Too, marriage equality. Like we have had a tumultuous uprising of people saying things need to change. Uh, but it's so fascinating as someone who spent so much time in community being like oh so you guys want to talk about it now <laughs> you want to in- you want to include us yeah you want you want to include everyone okay cool well always but- the fringe is always going to be like slightly ahead of <laughs> of the mainstream <laughs> yeah it is maybe uh, maybe it's just me catching up i'm like oh okay right so you want to join our gang now <laughs> I know. we've pioneered. always been in the cool gang <laughs> we pioneered it and that's actually there's a valuable checklist you know criteria there, like be comfortable um pioneering something know that when you um when you're going out into the world to create something new you're not following anyone it, it can it can be you know lonely oh, yeah on the on the leading edge and acknowledge it fuck like actually that's been a massive point of awareness for me the past year like the actual realization not everyone sees the world the way i see the world <laughs> like very humbling isn't it wow <laughs> yeah. wow you mean you guys don't cool yeah. mind-blowing and and the level going back to expectation expectation the level of pressure that people must have felt working for me <laughs> you know okay. my assumption well my assumption is they see what i see uh, right so it would trigger it trigger them that makes sense yep well i'm expecting unconsciously because i'm just like this is obvious you know that, mm-hmm. that, that, they, that they deliver and they're feeling pressure and they're feeling under acknowledged and unseen Ooh, that one that one is when you're running an org that is a <laughs> It's a hard one, but yet it's so worth it when they find it themselves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, think about everyone who's listening to this. Think about your bosses or your managers or, you know, if you're in bureaucracies. Mm-hmm. They just don't always make time to see you and people are just constantly disgruntled or dissatisfied with their workplace. And Take the initiative if that is you. Like literally whatever you're feeling take the time to actually you don't have to be triggered about it or erratic or or emotional about it just say hey you know i'm feeling this way and this is what i see to be a solution you know and put it on the table and take that initiative it's like quite amazing how few people take that initiative because they're Mm -hmm. waiting for someone else to lead a lot of the time I spend a lot of time in culture workshops these days and something I've never seen before was that a person could do that but there's also this unconscious silent killer in the culture, this energy that is not safe. Yeah. And so people don't realise that they're not speaking up because the environment yeah. is actually really unsafe. Like it's it's not... Um, you know, everyone talks about interpersonal skills between you and your teammates, you know, it's such a bullshit word where, but it, people are, are risk adverse. Like it's fascinating. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. But again, self-awareness, like if you come back to your own sense of self-security, you you will find it easier to assert yourself in a way that you're not taking, you know, things so personally. And I think both ways, like leaders, I think founders with founder syndrome, I call it founder syndrome and inability to let let go of the grip 
Um, they take it really personally when people don't deliver what they want. You know, I used to take it so personally. I was like, it was like, it was like a personal attack. Like you are doing this to me. That's like so. Oh my God, man. I would not have wanted to be on the other end of that. (laughs) When you went, I've really worked on it, guys. This is makes me tired. <laughs> people have generally enjoyed working for me. I hope. Of course, of course. And look, I promise you, I, <laughs> areas, of <laughs> areas of improvement. Areas of improvement. We've improved. I promise. I'm actually very successful, and uh... <laughs> I reflect a lot. This is more than a lot of leaders can say. <laughs> Uh, I think it's refreshing. Somebody asked me the other day, I want to produce a podcast series. And I looked at them and went, on what and why? And what problem are we solving? And who's it for? And <laughs> just hammered them. But I didn't do it in the nicest way possible. <laughs> but I said, I just want to oh, know. You like, you want to start a podcast? How original. Oh, she was like, don't start another podcast just for the sake of it. But that's what I like about what you're doing. Is I said, <laughs> why don't the podcasters turn up and do this you know that's what I'm liking about today Mm. this stuff is ugly and it's awkward and it's uncomfortable like I've just given everyone in this session (laughs) my failure CV yeah here's all the shit I failed at never once (laughs) have I told you any of the amazing shit I've done I'm like (laughs) and then this and then this happened and then I didn't even give five really (laughs) you <laughs> are I don't even give any context as to why like people should think my guests are amazing I just it's like straight into it but I'm so sick of it I'm sick Google of- me promise you <laughs> like honestly if people can connect and see something real like I don't know this is what I've come to this. if you can hear my failures if you can hear Em's failures and that makes you be like wow I want to get to know this person more Every, (laughs) this is my sell to the talent that I get on this podcast, every fan, follower, supporter you get from from this podcast loves you for you and you never have to pretend (laughs) to be anyone you're not. So I can't be fucked being somebody I'm not anymore. I'm like, I'm 40. I've got, I don't care what you think. And sometimes if you're rude to me. I will bite back at you. <laughs> well, I just, I think it's refreshing is what I really wanted to say that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You know, the <laughs> art of, the art of, the art of making mistakes, you know, like there's too many startups talking to people about failing fast, but they're never really going into what happens when it's like snakes and ladders you remember that game it's like we're going up and this is awesome and then <laughs> you go down then you back up again like it's a full game of snakes and ladder For real and people listening like maybe you don't know this from the lens of business but you know it in life like there are too many people in the world that had one massive failure and then that just it became unfinished business and they spent the rest of their life running away from it. Like I truly thought I was going to give up all of it, but I gave myself that time to listen to my body, all the things we talked about today. And I'm, there's a spark in me again. Like there's new things percolating and building and, you know, it's, it's like the perfect example of when there's a, a bushfire and, you know, you need to, it burns it back until. It rejuvenates the soil. Thank you. Couldn't find the phrase just then. I'm rejuvenating my soil, guys. (laughs) For real. If you find yourself on the snake falling down, actually it's, it's, it's not only you will get back, you will actually be able to, (laughs) <laughs> let's let's use the, the the government term that they're obsessed with at the moment build back better you will oh is that what they're using build back better okay all right yeah you will build back better into the new world order in their case <laughs> uh you the next will... podcast will be a conspiracy theories and the pandemic from the goal we'll do a series on on that for sure yeah we'll get we'll get i feel like conspiracy theorists feel very unfinished in the world right now <laughs> <laughs> they have a story. They have a story to tell. Everyone switches off after thirty seconds. 
Because <laughs> we've been trained to do that. Yeah, for real. Conspiracy theorists are just fringe, you know. I would have been considered a conspiracy theorist 10 years ago for saying, hey, maybe there are social reasons and cultural reasons why we have a mental health epidemic. That seriously was like crazy talk. Like, no, uh-huh. it was a biological predisposition and you take drugs and you just accept you'll have a mental illness forever. That truly was the opinion. Oh, now I look around think, and like people. Do you think they'll ever change the phrase from mental health to something else? Like just general health, well being? Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, it's such a um, fascinating yeah. phrase. 25 yeah. years ago, when I was doing workshops, <clears throat> there, was no, there was not an utter of the word mental health. Yeah. Anyway, I, I'm with you. Yeah. So, you know, you can build back that art faster and you'll actually be able to go to greater heights because you've got resilience and tenacity and insight that you didn't have before and cliche but but true, you know, like the pain. No, that, oh, the greatest teacher. Yeah, the pain, great teacher. But it's, you know, the, the message in um, my first guest's interview which i freaking loved she was like we need to stop being afraid of rock bottom because when we're afraid of rock bottom you know this is what really this that the deepest lesson this is what i got from what she said i'm paraphrasing Mm -hmm. the deepest lesson in rock bottom are the deepest lessons we're here to learn and that that's one of the greatest gifts that we can be given and to just not be afraid because we can't control when that we can't always control when that rock bottom is you know and and so we can't go through life trying to prevent that rock bottom just embrace it with your whole heart your whole you know your heart wide open mind open like courage take on the world without the fear of the rock bottom and what you create from that space is so pure and so real and so um, needed in the world. It really is. There's something almost just so delicious and sexy about the lessons you learn from the painful dark moments. Like it is just such joy. Yeah. And yeah. I don't, I, I don't know if people understand that side of it too. It's like the that joy can... that comes out of rock. rock. Are you, you're going to get super joy. Like you've never felt joy like, like this. Will. It's not a maybe. Like if you commit, and this is really like, listen to this. <laughs> like you will get that. My biggest fear, my biggest fear was I will never get back what I've lost. But we need to just, okay, you will, it will never look like that again. But what you're actually going to have, <laughs> despite what anyone in your life is telling you, maybe they're calling you a failure and it's, you know, you fucked it up forever, whatever, just get rid of all of that noise, all of those opinions. And get rid of them. <laughs> and them, um, you know, <laughs> just come back to you. And, yes, it's a journey. It's not going to happen overnight. But what you have on the other side of rock bottom is so much more than you could have ever even dreamed when you were in your last peak of your last mountain. Yeah, I had a workshop the other day and someone said, I don't know how you do it, um, but it's just like, it's just incredible to watch you. Like I trust, I trust what you're saying. And there was something just good for me to reflect in her compliment, which was, of course you trust me because I've gone through the flames and I'm not afraid to stand up in front of you now and just, know that that's all there and you can sense that in me I think the people who are feeling afraid of failure by not facing into it or going into your darkness or your suffering you know people can feel it tenfold so that people will get from you as that's such a valuable point and that's such such a valuable point and you will be alone in in some of that process and actually it's not a bad thing it's it's a power no alone is aloneness is different to loneliness yeah aloneness is but it'll get to a point where you start to draw that distinction where you realize oh actually i i'm not abandoning myself anymore you know and and that's 
it's so it's, I just want everyone listen, listen to me <laughs> listen to me I want everyone because I see how much people run away from this and if you were to just stop abandoning yourself like yummy, just, yummy. it's what I like, joke around I'm like yes it's so it's scary wet. it is it's like it's the dark cave that Joseph Campbell talks about right the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek and really watch Star Wars I did it on the weekend yeah. they were going into their darkness and they came out and the force was there you know like <laughs> exactly like here you you beat fear you know and you have yourself and Fuck, like, this year, I've been to seven countries this year. I've been on, like, the, the wildest adventure journey. Like, I left, I left. I want to go to seven countries again. A serious life in Australia. And everyone was putting so much fear in me when I left. Um, oh, yeah, and yeah, that was intense, wasn't it? Yeah, well, it was an intense time to be doing what I wanted to do, you know, Um and I just committed to my path and there have been times where it's really felt like I'm the only one in the world that thinks the way I think. But in those moments, even though there's been pain and whatever, it's, I just, I really love myself. <laughs> like I'm really my own best friend. And there were, there were still parts of me, you know, even a couple of years ago that I wanted that love from people outside of me, not even my audience, just in my relationships, my friendships, my, you know, family, whatever. I wanted them to love those parts of me because I didn't know how to love those parts of me. Mm, and it's gorgeous. The, the That's flip, amazing. Yeah, the, the script has really changed. Now when when people want to get close to me, I know my worth. And I'm like, well, I know how long it's taken for me to get close to me. <laughs> so for you to come into my life and expect that you're going to get close to me, you know, like that, or demand that closeness you know, or, or want something of me that I'm not really prepared to give just yet. I don't feel any insecurity anymore or like, you know, um, difficulty just setting that boundary and saying, no, you know, or if, if you want that from me, this is, this is what and I need. Not appeasing it anymore as yeah. well, right? Yeah. And I think that's really powerful for certain people who are listening, like, quite often be like I can't get to where you are but there's a lot of discipline and hard work and it is a gradual incremental change and then one day these little little bits that you're doing it's like a floodgate isn't it like this epic big change from all these little things that you're doing and you know there's no doubt like even when I first met you there was no doubt I heard you say with such resonance truth honesty grace maybe even I love myself you know so that's cool yeah I remember actually um the at collective potentials event one of the speakers that you're you're so bad I can't remember her name she's amazing your friend speaks on self-love yeah Emma love Emma power Emma power yeah she said something that actually really I still sometimes think about in her talk and it was she was sharing about when she first realized um that the inner voice when she did something that she usually would have entered immediate self-criticism she realized the incremental kind of uh manifestation of all the work she had done when she fucked up but the default voice was it's okay yes I was like default voice yeah that's the joy voice isn't it for me it's like oh shit freedom it's fucking freedom you're not battling the all the voices in your mind that's like you're a you're a failure you're fucked up judge you what the fuck we I've just got this vision of me high-fiving myself and you know hugging my little girl simultaneously skipping down into the the rows of oh my god I've got a default voice it's changed dandelion fields but that's the the relationship like imagine having a friend I think about it this way that is there with you always and you've you've fucked up in a way that you just think is totally unforgivable and they just they're just like I love you like it's all man all good doesn't change anything doesn't doesn't change it like it changes a lot on the outside but this your heart who you are your worth it doesn't doesn't change any of that and you can you can let 
the rest go and you can start again, you know. That level of self-love and self-compassion, it's not, a, it's not an absence of self-responsibility. It's a willingness to front up and be like, okay, this is the consequence of this failure of yeah. I love myself anyway. I'm going to move forward. I'm going to find a way to move forward. So powerful. And people forget, isn't it, like that awareness or that default voice or stopping and self-reflecting, take responsibility, like, you know, so much of the time I have a vortex, like especially like with even said to my therapist the other day, I go on these huge tirades with myself and I'll be like, I'm so damaged because of all these horrible things that happened to me when I'm younger. She goes, do you? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, yeah, wait, I've got a lesson here. I've got a lesson here. Um, and I said, you know, that that vortex, I'm it like, <laughs> I'm in it. And I can't help but have those little moments where I go, it's cool if I do that for three minutes because I used to do it for three hours. And it's kind of cool that if I did it for three hours, because I probably would have done it for 30 hours. And over those 30 hours, even if I did it for 30 hours, I used to do it for three days. Mm-hmm. And even then, last year, I did it for three months. But that was my darkness, the rock bottom we're talking about. And over time, that beautiful awareness of it's gone in three minutes with that awareness, you know, mm-hmm. asking myself and reflecting on what do I need right now in the body? You know, like that is a routine or a default process yes. that I put in place. That relationship to that part of you that you've criticised, I think that that is like so that. valuable. It takes the time. When I was in the, the most difficult parts of anorexia, it was like, you know, once every three months I would have a good day. Do you know what I mean? Like that that was the, the ratio. And so to, to expect to expect um, success to look like one one day every three months being a bad day at that point, it, again, it's just more perfectionism. I needed I needed to focus on two days a month, three days a month being good, you know. And then it does hit this momentum. And I I remember this in in my recovery. I could go um, initially, like, you know, minutes were were good without thinking about calories and and weight and whatever I was obsessed with in my thinking obsessively. Then Mm -hmm. have like an hour. To to be able to watch a movie and not think about those things was like amazing, you know. Then day. (laughs) Yes, days, I know. Weeks, months. And and now I'm like, wow, I have and of course <laughs> you just said I love myself and had nothing to do with that. I'm such a bad bitch. No one can like a, this is what I love about this. It's like, yeah, <laughs> anyone who's listening to that who has any form of you trying to idolize Nicole don't because she just put a shitload of work in and no one really knew about it and here she's turned up you too can get where she can <laughs> yeah. where she is too okay. and don't expect it to go away like people say all the time in recovery whatever that recovery is people specifically say it a lot in recovery from an eating disorder like it never goes away and that's that probably is true like every so often I'll have I'll have a day where I you know have those thoughts or I'm not seeing myself clearly in the mirror but it, it's so it's so far from ruling my life. Yep. It is so far from being in the driver's seat. And that is the growth. Once upon a time, that motherfucker was in the driver's seat, strapped in, not giving me the wheel, like not even for a second. And yeah. it was driving my car and it was directing everything that I saw and thought and felt yeah. about myself yeah. in the world. And oh, there, so glad to talking about this. It's so good. Freedom. There is freedom, but you need to be patient and compassionate and real and honest with yourself through the process. And I think it is really important to have a psych do these courses, have a really great friendship group because I don't think you heal from these things at all on your own. No, it is very yeah, At all. Like I truly believe that social connection is at the core of healing. 
Mm. You cannot do it without. Yeah, it's, it's 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 incredibly difficult to to do it on your own, and I actually think like in my journey, I thought that I had. <laughs> you know, this is the irony. You yeah. just find another. Way. You just find well, another way. There are times where you you have to be the hero that sets off, but you know you still meet the mentor along the way. You still get the tribe. You got to come back to, like, mm-hmm. I think there is a a need for you to do it on your own for a bit there. Yeah. Oh, look. Willing. You need to be willing. Yeah. No, no longer like taking responsibility. I mean, that's a whole other podcast, but you've got to get to a point. I think this is the pivotal moment where you're like, I'm not going to do this anymore. This is my line in the sand. I Sometimes that looks like I got up and cleaned the house. Yeah. Like exactly. that can be a line in this. It doesn't have to be dramatic. It's like I tidied up my desk because that's the first place or I got out a journal and wrote out my time. Yeah, that's it. As a mum, I made time for me or I was still stuck in my relationship and so I went and had a coffee at a cafe. Like that can be the line in the sand and that momentum builds. It doesn't have to be dramatic. The thing in it is you stop waiting for the circumstance to change in order for you to change. It is it is. Yeah. You should be getting your team to write down some of these bumper quotes and just stamp NicoleGibson.com. People will buy that shit, mate. <laughs> it's yeah. so good, though. It's true. Oh, shit, no one talks about it. And I think people don't know how to talk about it. Like you were just sharing before, so many people think that high performers or people that have built exceptional things, like it's luck, you know, and so many people think that. Or, or they just they just fundamentally have something that you don't have. And sure, yes. sure, maybe, like, let's just get really real. Maybe someone who is successful in the way you want to be successful, maybe they are more attractive than you. Okay, the, 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 the road is not to, to try and tell yourself that you're as attractive as them. That's, you know, that's, it's about coming back to yourself and being like, I, who am I? You know, who am I? What are my strengths? Because we all have strengths. That person that you think is only successful because they're attractive, they're probably struggle daily with people just wanting to, you know, uh, that wanting something from them, you know, and their biggest struggle is not knowing if people around them are real and they have genuine oh intentions, you know. They have a different struggle. Yeah. It's not more significant. It's not less significant. It's a different struggle. My intelligence for years, I didn't even understand that I was intelligent. That's how that's how much I was fucked up by it. Imagine being hyper intelligent, not realizing you're intelligent, thinking everyone else is intelligent as you, having people intimidated by that intelligence, abuse you and think that it's you. And with your intelligence, all you do is overanalyze yourself. Oh, that is such a cool one. If someone really gets their own insecurities and overthinking themselves to realise that actually you're probably more intelligent than the people you're around, (laughs) that's such a good one. Not realising it, you know, so we all have these pain points and none of us understand fully another person's struggle. A lot of the time the person doesn't even understand their struggle properly. So that comparison coming back and being like it's not about they're not successful because they're attractive. They're not successful because they're intelligent. Stop making these very generalized associations. Elon Musk is, you know, um, created Tesla because he's a genius. Okay, there is truth in that. He also but he's also batshit crazy. Yeah, he slept on the fucking floor of his factory for months. He literally likened success to eating shaved glass and having it cut your mouth every single Dude, day i've like, watched those depots on him and i don't know how again sort of mean that snakes and ladder shit Oof. yeah so stop it cut it out just just stop whatever you stop it i've just no, stop it stop it <laughs> stop it cut it out because it's bullshit it's not true Whatever thing you think in someone else is the reason they are where they are, they have, a, they have an equal amount of vulnerability in that strength. That is, that is human. And you have strengths too. 
that you also have weaknesses, you know, to, to balance those strengths out. But you need to know what that is and you need to help that become the foundation of how you progress in your life and, and in your relationship with yourself. Yeah, you don't start with being such a deep thinker like you are initially. Like imagine little Nicole compared to the, the processes you have in place or the, wow, <laughs> wouldn't that be funny to have little Nicole sitting next to you live? <laughs> she was like probably more in, in intense because she didn't realise that other people, I've learned to slow down my, my processing and like how my brain interprets information which is probably a little bit on the spectrum, you know. I didn't, I didn't real, I didn't realize, I didn't realize. So I was just like full, like gun ho all the time at school in my relationships. Like I, I saw the end, and I thought everyone saw the end, and I just wanted to talk about that. Like now, um, there's a lot of pain in that because I couldn't understand why people weren't meeting me. I took it very personally, you know. You know, I'm actually think I'm learning. Th- through about myself through you. I'm like, what? what? I used to think oh, I was weird. <laughs> they were the weirdos, <laughs> idiot. They couldn't keep up with me. Yeah, well, they have their own thing. And what, what, like, just play a mind game, imaginary game with yourself, and think what, what were they thinking? You know, like, what was, what was their perception? Because your speed maybe made them. You are so awesome. <laughs> That's all they were really thinking. Oh, my God, this girl is so fun. I just want to be her. I'm sure of it. Probably that. Yeah, but then also, like, I I don't know how to relate to it and then, then maybe that. Oh, no, it. I'm in a contract at the moment and the feedback I got was people, some people are freaked out by your enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> I was like. So the feedback is that they're freaked out by my enthusiasm? Could be worse. Could be worse. <laughs> Could be worse. I said, okay, that's a first. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, so funny. I love that you said maybe an hour tonight. <laughs> I said half an hour. We are, we actually, half an hour. We've got to catch a flight soon. Um, <laughs> but I love these conversations so much. Yeah, I, I love them. I love that you just hit record and we just go. It's so ridiculously hilarious to me. It's like, all right, sure. <laughs> I hope there's something in there for somebody. I'm not sure why, but maybe there is. There's totally, yeah, he- heaps of value, I think. Being, uh, and let us know, you guys, like, does it does it help you place your own experiences hearing um, and the other guests share, like, Actually, the the reality of what life can be like, none of us get taught, you know, expect expect these things in in life. (laughs) I'm taking the piss. I'm learning just by listening to you. I'm like, yeah, I am so unfinished and it's so good. (laughs) Exactly. I'm so unfinished. I can go and skip down the street with my poppy daisy field and eat my lollipop in the sunshine because I've got joy. I'm unfinished. Yeah, totally. That's such a beautiful place to to be. <clears throat> I hope you do that. I hope you do that tomorrow or t- tonight. I am. It is 30 degrees in Melbourne for once. <laughs> I'm going to the beach. Amazing. I will jump around in the water thinking of this conversation (laughs) they hate us in Kilda for me oh no I'm going to talk here down the great ocean road babe um I love you you're an incredible human um I love having conversations with you I really do think these people are very lucky that you just do this because you love community really yep I love you too thank you Always the greatest pleasure. This was so fun. <laughs> so <laughs> good. That was great. And that's a wrap. You're the best. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is a wrap. I actually do have to catch my flight. See you, mate. Love you. Because love hey, family, if you loved this podcast and you want to stay connected to a tribe of heroes all around the world that are here to 
make the world a better place and act from their hero brain and act from a place of love, bringing their head and heart into cohesion, then I just want to invite you to jump in our Facebook group for free. Just search uh, the Critical Mass Crew and you're going to find us there. We have tribe calls weekly and um, these podcasts actually streamed into that group. So we have an an additional 20 minute Q&A with the guests every single week that is exclusive to people in the group. So you'll also find the link in the show notes. See you in there.